The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. I'm Patrick, Head of Technology at professional services firm Collins SBA. I'm a former financial advisor who just loves solving business problems and creating better client experiences using technology. Join me each week as we unpack the tech on offer to advise professionals, stay on top of tech trends and help you break free from the analysis paralysis experience when building and maintaining a great tech stack. This podcast is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Imagine a world where you can build a complete picture of your client's financial wealth. With NetWealth, you can track and monitor external bank accounts alongside residential and investment properties. Join the dots with Zeppo, a client data warehouse that connects your CRM and other tech systems with NetWealth. Discover a world of client data at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. Today we're talking interactive, engaging and compliant advice presentations with Aaron Cooper, founder and CEO at Live Prezzo. So Live Prezzo, specifically their Live Prezzo for advice solution, deeply integrates with X-Plan. And now I'm not just talking importing clients or automated client notes. So it integrates to make interactive ROAs and SOAs in a fraction of the time without compromising on compliance. And all of this is off the shelf and out of the box. It's incredibly difficult to strike a balance between something that's both engaging and compliant. And as Aaron mentions, it's one of the only tools out there where the quality of the client experience can be measured, rather than just the time it took the advice team to prepare. I started by asking Aaron what the oldest piece of tech he still owns is and whether he still uses it. I had to, I had to have a think about this one. Um, right. I'm not the kind of person who kind of holds on and gets nostalgic about old tech. So I'm kind of the opposite. I, I like to get my hands on the newest toys. But um, I did realize I've got an old um, Super Nintendo system so that I can play um, Mark, you know, basically. Yeah, wow. every, every now and again, I kind of feel the urge and pull it out and all I play is Super Mario Bros. <laughs> but it's the, the original. Yeah, wow. Okay, so that's obviously still working. Maybe a bit of a blowing on the old, um, I'm not sure what you'd call them, like the games. I assume you slot them in like sort of floppy disk style, or is that how yeah, it works? Yeah, it's an old cartridge. Um, yeah, nice. It does the job, and it's still got the crappy old graphics and the great music, so I love it still. Yeah, yeah probably amazing. comes out twice a year. Cool. No, that's really cool. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm surprised that's still working, and obviously you've kept it in, in good nick. Um, I guess, yeah, moving to this sort of day and age, um, are there maybe one or two ways that you're using AI either personally or in your, your work or business life? Uh, yes, yeah, so personally I use AI regularly just for editing and summarising copy. I think that's what it's best at. Um, for, th- for me, it's for things like, marketing materials, blog post articles, that kind of thing. Um, and for work, LifePresso does a lot of integration and data visualization, as I'm sure we'll get into after. But yep. um, we, we're actually working on a feature that will use AI to write client-specific insights based on the data. So it's one thing for us to pull data in and visualize it nicely, but that's not the whole story. Um, and we know that it's it's time-consuming for people and not everybody's good at writing the, the insights that go with that. So the idea will be compress a button and it writes it for you if you want. You can then edit it. Um, but I think it's interesting that both my personal and work uses amount to the same thing. It's it's AI making a human's life easier, not replacing what they do. Yeah, love it. No, it seems like that sort of qualitative or qualitative content is is really, I guess, the the most popular use case or the use case that seems to work really well or give you that sort of starting block for for polishing it off. Yep. And yeah, just picking up on your comment there about um, you know the commentary on the sort of data visualization. Like, I think we we tend to see all these magical statistics around how you know more than fifty percent of people are, are visual learners, but um, you know, eighty was it eighty three percent of statistics are also made up. But the fact that you can um, have those 
you know, every learning style is catered to. So you can actually have something that's explaining the the visuals and you can cater to all learning styles and also yeah, have AI tell that story of that data, I think is really powerful too. So Absolutely. I guess getting into Live Prezo as a product and maybe I've probably jumped a little bit ahead. I'd love to know, I guess, your origin story, Aaron, and then how um, you've ended up uh, with Live Prezo as a product and how that came to be. Joel, so first of all, I'd be lying if I said we had even contemplated this industry when we started. Uh, when we started, we were called Sales Prezo. Um, and it was about 12 years ago, we had a small agency and we were working with some big Australian companies and helping them to tell their story, as we would term it, um, through their sales channels, hence the name Sales Prezo. We'd spend months lovingly crafting these stories with the marketing teams of big companies and they were full of beautifully written and designed content. It was all super on brand. Um, and they had lots of industry data points to talk to, but there was a problem with them, which was because we were working on the master content with the marketing team, everything was very general. It was very, it was about the company, the market, and even customers in general, but nothing was, uh, nothing was about the specific customer a salesperson was going to see that day. Um, and the way the salespeople dealt with that was once they got their hands on it, they immediately changed it which you can imagine the marketing people were pulling their hair out about after all that work. Uh, and they'd, they'd, the salespeople would go and find all sorts of data about the customer to make it relevant, which is fantastic that they were doing that. They'd do sometimes things like manually add the customer's logo on everything to make it feel more personalized, which works. It's, it's really worth doing. That was the right thing to do as it meant they took tailored presentations to each customer meeting, but it had its own problem. That lovingly crafted story was ripped apart or just ignored. Uh, the brand representation was inconsistent at best, um, if not just plain wrong. Uh, and there was no governance over what actually happened, uh, I'd say, where the rubber hits the road in the meeting with the customer. Um, and the upshot was the quality and customer experience were all over the place. Uh, but worst of all, it took each salesperson hours, sometimes days, to make each presentation because everything was manual. So we recognized there was an opportunity to kill multiple birds with one very different approach to presentations. Firstly, it was integrate with all the systems that the salespeople get their data from so it can all happen automatically, which obviously is going to save them loads of time. But ensure the content remains beautiful, compliant, and consistent because no one needs to edit most of it. So there's not an opportunity to mess it up. Um, and, but, but we also recognize two extra critical things. Like don't go to all that trouble to produce something that looks like PowerPoint or Word. You know, it's an opportunity to do things really differently. Take the opportunity to make the content dynamic and interactive uh, to literally engage customers better. So that was the first thing. And the second thing was track everything. So, the, again, because we're doing things in a much more digital way, we, we could do that, but it meant the business knows what's presented by who to which customers, uh, but also what's viewed by customers in their own time when you share something with them, an interactive version with them. So, we're, at the time, we were working with REA, real estate, the um, and we mentioned this idea that we had to them, and they essentially bought it on the spot, but we hadn't built it yet. It was just an idea, so we got cracking, and a few months later, they were our first customer way back then, and are still going strong all these years later. Um, and we now have customers in other industries like Booking dot com, Asahi, CUB, and Flight Center, but also Vanek and Vanguard in a more adjacent industry. Um, so all different industries, but they use like Presley for the same sort of things to save. Whoever it is at interacting with the customer, whether that's a salesperson or advisor, hours per presentation by pulling data from those inter integrated systems and making beautiful, interactive, compliant content that's all about the customer. So that's where we started. But fast forward several years, and one of our investors, who's a financial advisor, came to me and said, You should take all of that and apply it to my industry. Um, and it turns out there's a lot of data about the client and financial advice, and it's super time-consuming to get it out. 
and make an advice document, but worst of all, my opinion, but the documents are terrible. <laughs> you know, by and large, they're pretty bad. So they're compliance focused tones that no one I sound I still like no one really even expects the client to read them. Um so we put a lot of time into building an off the shelf version of Live Prezo that integrates deeply with X plan to make interactive client reviews and ROAs and recently SOAs in seconds that us that don't compromise in yeah, no, that's amazing. So, yeah, you've obviously got some big names there and in, in multiple industries, and now there's that. Um, so, just confirming, Live Prezo, uh, you've got different products, but there's a specific product for the advice um, advice businesses. Do you mind sort of talking a bit more about about that? How you sort of get started with it, and maybe the setup time, etc. Yeah, so there's kind of two products there's the the classic product if you like is for those kind of companies i mentioned um we call them enterprise customers they all have their own version that integrates with whatever they want um and then we built this product that we just call like prezzo advice which is where nothing's custom everything's off the shelf trying to make it really easy for people but easy for people who use x plan for now at least um and the idea is you log in with your X plan account and you can make your first document in, in a few minutes. It's just everything, all the data comes from all the standard places in X plan. You, when you log in with your X plan account, you get access to whatever you have access to. So whichever modules, you make some choices when you make a, a Prezo, as we call it, it just kind of all flows through. It's pretty yeah. straightforward. We've worked very hard to make it as straightforward as possible for this audience. Yeah. No, amazing. And then would you say then because you've got that really ready to go and it's obviously you've alluded to it's very easy to get started and and it's out of the box, would you say then it's replacing the traditional sort of paper-based or word-based advice document? Like how are businesses using it? There's two camps really, I think, in terms of how people are using it now. There's those who use like Prezzo as the advice presentation but still have the old printed style version and those who are only using like Prezo. But that's clearly changing already as practices get used to doing things a much more digital way. And it's worth noting that we are yet to find a dealer group or independent practice that hasn't given us compliance approval. And it's for a few important reasons. The compliance team can centrally control every block of text, every image, every video. So they actually have more control over that than they normally do. So, And because it's all web-based, when they make an update, everyone uses it instantly. They don't have to send around a new word template and say, yeah. please use this one, don't use the old one. The users don't have a choice but to use the latest version. So there's that. As I mentioned before, they can track everything that happens. So I think of, a, of compliance as having two halves. There's trying to make sure everybody does the right thing in the first place, but then track everything that happens just in case. So we track absolutely everything, everything the advisors do, everything their clients do by themselves when they're looking at a share. So there's that complete audit trail, and that audit trail is saved back to X plan automatically as well. So it's all just kind of close and believe nicely. And then the last bit is I can tell you I've tried to get rid of PDFs, but we still have them. So yeah. you can turn one of our nice interactive presentations into a PDF and it has all the detail that you're used to in a in a document. But obviously it's not interactive and we can't track them because they're locked away in Acrobat. We're, all we can track is when somebody downloaded one. Um, but they're there because we know some people just don't want to let them go. Yeah, I think it's it's just it's a catch-all, isn't it? Like you you can't have obviously the product that does 99% of everything, we're ready to go and there's that one client that wants to deviate from the yeah. process or one advisor as well. It's just easier to let people have what they want sometimes. Yeah. No, I'm with you. No, that's really intriguing. So would you say then, uh, so advisors would maybe use it to you know present it live, maybe do a pre-recorded video of themselves taking clients through it as well and then – I assume they can send it out uh, securely as well to clients and then you get all that audit trail tracking like you were uh, mentioning before. Yeah, we, we always advocate, in, and this is true of all of the industries we work in, we advocate that the best the best kind of workflow is 
present either in person or remotely to the client, walk them through it, then share a copy with them afterwards. But that yeah. said, I know I know many practices that do it the other way around. They actually share it beforehand, let the clients walk through it, and then they meet to go through it and the, the client's going to come um, with questions, I guess. So you can do it either way, but definitely some combination of presenting and sharing is the best. Um, the best way to do things. I love it. Um, yeah, no, this is really compelling. So, and I guess as you're mentioning before, around the you know once clients either have it before, and you've got that audit trail, I assume you'd be you'd be able to see you know they spent ten seconds on this slide. Maybe the advisor would be able to look at that beforehand and go, we better focus on this stuff. Maybe it's fees, or maybe it's a particular recommendation where they haven't actually they've just brushed past it, whether that's intentional or unintentional. Yeah, you get you get. Every time a client views the share, um, you get a little report sent by email, and it's also in our in the apps that people use. Um, shows every slide that they looked at, how long they spent on which on the slides, which slides they didn't look at, um, and then there's kind of reporting at a practice level where you can compare. A really useful comparison is what do the advisors spend time on versus what do the clients spend time on in, yeah. in their own time and. I know in um, we had one customer in the, the actually the sales space, but accounting sales, where their team of hundred and something salespeople, we ran that report, looked at the top ten slides that the salespeople spent time on, the top ten slides that the customers spent time on. There wasn't one slide that was in both lists, which was just as bad as it is. It was gold for the training team to teach them you are spending your time. Probably, I know in their case, it was all the sales team was spending all the slide, spending their time on the slides about the company, whereas the, the customers wanted to know what's going on in the market and what's going on with my business. So it was really clear from that reporting there was that big schism there. Yeah, that's a, that's an incredible example of, of a really clear data driven decision, and just making sure that we're spending yeah spending time on on what clients are actually looking at and, and feel that's valuable, which I imagine, as you we sort of mentioned before, that paper-based SOA, it's probably 90% of it where uh, it's not valuable at all or if, if at all. And then just on that, like would you say, like who, who would be the typical user in a, in a financial planning firm? Obviously, the advisor is presenting it, they're reviewing it, et cetera, but are you giving the keys to your maybe power planning team to actually create the document? How does that sort of work? The, the typical users of power planners and advisors, we also get practice managers having their own account. It just depends on the practice and setup. And I touched on this briefly before, but we've tried really hard to match the product to the way practices work. Um, so we know changing years of ingrained behavior is tough. Um, yeah. So the last thing we wanted to do was force people to change their own way of working to suit us. Um, so it definitely depends on who in the practice has what X-Plan access because you need access to the modules to get the data for the documents. But the typical workflow is PowerPlanner logs in who has all of that module access and they create the document or Prezo as we call it and hands it over as a function in the the software to hand over something Um, and you hand over to the advisor who is then the person who presents and shares typically. But if an advisor has all the access, then they can do it all themselves if they want. Perfect. And I assume because you've got that sort of deep integration with X Plan and it's coming out really sort of templated but client specific, you would not only be seeing you've got compliance enhancements, you've got client engagement enhancements, but you're also saving a truckload of time too. Would that be fair? Yeah, it's. I mean, the the, the stats we've got from. The, everyone we've been working with for the last few years on this, um, if you take a typical ROA, what we've been told is the time saving is has moved them from five hours to five minutes. Wow. Which has a nice ring to it, but it's actually based on um, practices telling us that on average it was taking them five hours, obviously sometimes more or less, but that's typical time for a power planner to do an X merge then mess about in Word and fix things and add things or whatever. And with like present it takes about five minutes on average. So huge time saving. But the interesting thing with that is we talk about time saving all the time because it's it's very important, but mm-hmm. also because it's really easy to measure. That the feedback we tend to get is 
love that it saves time, but the reason I'm using live press is because of the client experience, which is everyone knows is important, but it's almost impossible to measure. So it's um, yeah. we, we kind of stick to the time saving because it's an easy one, but it's definitely not the most important thing from what everybody's telling us. Yeah. And I guess you can now actually probably for the first time measure that through, as you were saying before, with how much you're actually looking at it on a per slide basis. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as I said, you get that all of that for both what the advisor's doing, how long they're spending. And we, we actually saw some interesting stats recently. We were looking at across all of the users and just see the clear patterns of which slides everybody's spending time on. Um, you can actually see just by looking at which slides, you can very easily infer, maybe not say directly, but you can infer the kinds of conversations that are going on by which slides people pause on for quite a while. So you get to that slide and there's, if, if a slide's being viewed on average for 10 minutes, it suggests the conversation happens there. And you see that those stats across all of the practices we have, it's pretty clear that that's where the conversation kind of hinges. Um, so it's, it's, it's amazing to be able to see what every, everybody's been doing. Yeah. No, it's really compelling. And I, I guess just on that, you mentioned before about how you've got the sort of household names or the big brands there that were probably originally using it for and still are from a sales point of view. Would you say that as well in the, I guess, before the ROA or the SOA stage when we're engaging new clients or sending them proposals, it's also being used in that context too for financial planning firms or maybe not so much? Uh, it depends which one. So the I mentioned before we've got a really off-the-shelf product at the moment and it's very focused on reviews, ROAs, and now SOAs. And I say now because about a month ago we added risk researcher integration so we can do insurance oh, well, recommendations okay. and we'll be building that out. But we do have, um, like we've got one dealer group that's been with us for three years and they're on what I mentioned before, one of those enterprise versions. So they've got a more custom thing and for them custom means... The contents, as you can imagine, pretty similar. Um, mm -hmm. What's different is they have an integration with X-Plan and Dynamics. So with our software is integrated with both of those to make the whole workflow work. But to get back to your question, they um, they also have different use cases. So they don't just have the documents like what we have with the other products, but they have stuff back in proposal time. They also have, we have a version of the platform that we will bring to the off-the-shelf product that means that their clients can log into the client portal, click a button whenever they want, and get a subset of a client review doc, Trezo, whenever they want. Um, and so an on-demand, things that we call that product, Trezo bot. So, okay. so yeah, that, it can be used for all sorts of situations, but the one that we heard loud and clear that everybody was asking for first was managing client reviews because well, I didn't know this till pretty late in the piece because um, I'm not from the industry. I'm learning as best as I can. We were told that 50 to 60% of the ROAs that practices have to do are typically no or low change, meaning yep. um, no revenue from practice. But still, we're taking five hours on average to make. So, and there's a lot of them because you obviously have to do one a year for everybody. So, a lot of time spent. So, we heard um, from we originally we're going to do SOAs because everybody talks about that as being the challenge. But then we yeah. did some more research and realized actually there's a much bigger problem to solve first with the reviews, get them to the point that they're out the door in a five minutes. Um, and then we've turned, we've now turned our attention to the SOA side of things. Yeah, like it's yeah much higher volume or in a typical practice, but also less. Um, or once you know that you're doing an ROA, there's less compliance or, or less moving parts, I guess, when you compare it to an SOA, which is obviously where it gets gets pretty crazy from like a branching or a decision perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Um, would you say as well there's maybe a use case for using it internally as well? If you say maybe from like an LMS or sort of team training perspective or you sort of think about a that? Lot, a lot of our enterprise customers use it like that. Uh, we've actually got a customer who has just briefed us on holding the use case that's basically an LMS thing. But what most of them use it for is day one when someone new starts in their sales to do live presence is the place they start because it has the story that they're supposed to understand and tell 
So some of our customers have, so I mentioned REA, they probably these days have 300 to 400 slides that cover every meeting they would ever have. So from a brand new customer that REA they don't get many of because they kind of have everybody already, yeah. um, all the way through to renewals and price changes and um, any anything in between and all the extra products that they've added over the years. So having that as the resource for a new starter is gold because it's it's not only the place to learn about it, but it's the thing they're going to use to sell it. Yeah, there's there's nothing better than sort of yeah learning using that tool that you're then going to use and your clients or prospects are going to use as well. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, I guess I guess just on that, so you've got um, you mentioned the I think it was over 300 slides there. So are they essentially the building blocks for creating a tailored uh, Prezo for whatever client it is based on the industry or their needs. And then you sort of go from there based on, as you mentioned as well, the compliance team uh, might have approved wording or approved sort of formatting, et cetera. So you're really starting with a template and then building it from there, depending on the product or the or the solution that you sort of move forward with. Yeah, so because we, this product really, it's off the shelf. We, we've kind of attacked the, the main data driven flags and everybody would include in RLAs yeah. and SOAs now. It, the best way to think of it is there's all that data driven stuff that I've mentioned is all automated. It all comes through and makes everybody's life easy and it's interactive to help tell the story. But layered on that is all the compliance content that the dealer group or the compliance team want in there. So that can be text. Well, the text on all the slides, including our data-driven ones, so the little intro, the footer, the title of the slide, all that can all be changed. So that's kind of a compliance layer, and they can also add their own slides with whatever needs to be on them around it to become the kind of set of content that people can use. Um, and then the third layer is the practice or the power plan of making the document can add their own content to that. So... It's this kind of three-layer thing that all comes together to ultimately make the document you're going to use. But one thing that's quite different to the usual word templates is, and um, I get asked this a lot, um, when people are asking about the what we're going to do with SOAs, um, there's no, in our world, there's no ROA template and SOA template. It's one set of content and you choose what you want to use for the given meeting or interaction with the client. So you you can stick to very formalized sets of content and we've got a feature that we call presets that allows you to do that to cut a set of slides for a specific situation. But if you want to also include a slide on something else that you don't normally include for whatever reason, you can just do that really easily. Like a good example of that is um it's not all data driven content that we do. So we have um a bunch of educational content um, specifically around insurances, because one of the things I learned pretty easy as as a client of an advisor was I had no idea of what TPD was, for example. So we have a bunch of videos that come with it um, that explain the different types of insurances. And so you can use our ones out of the box, but um, and we actually just um, borrowed them from Iris. Um but you can use our ones out of the box, but if a dealer group or a practice has their own versions, and I know quite a few do, they can replace them to become the educational content. But we also have a, an interactive quiz in there about insurances that you probably okay. wouldn't use in a meeting, but it's great content to send to a client. Um, and that's the perfect example of something that you might include, even if it's not specifically related to the ROA. It might be some a topic for later, but it's a good way to, to kind of warm up the client to the topic. But the client goes through it. There's only four questions and you can customize all of it as a practice. Um, but if the client gets the wrong answer, it explains the right one. It shows them the video. Um, and as I mentioned before, we track it. So if there ever was any question over whether the client um, had been educated, you'd be able to say, well, actually, both people, the client and the partner, both looked at it for seven minutes each doing the quiz and watched the video or whatever. So it's it's not just the data-driven stuff. There's some of that other kind of storytelling, yeah. educational stuff in there as well. 
No, it really is out of the box. You're really um, just confirming that now with sort of coming with with pre-done videos and, and questionnaires. I think that's really compelling and, and making it as easy as possible for a business to adopt it and get started. I think that's really, really great. From, I guess, given we're, we're now sending out proposals with sort of client information, client data, um, I guess the irony is that, you know, the alternative is sending out, you know, Word documents or PDFs via email, which is obviously more insecure. But what's been the approach to security? Like, how do you, how do you handle that? What's the approach there? Uh, so, first up, it's worth noting that the the global customers I mentioned at the beginning have made us jump through every hoop you can imagine yeah. um, uh, for both security and privacy. And so, the platform is and always has made security a top priority. Otherwise, we just wouldn't have customers like that. Um, and then we go through similar assessments with dealer groups. Um, typically, so all the dealer groups we work with have put us through some version of an assessment on security and privacy and with their tech teams. And even in the case of something like Planner Central, we did the same with IRS themselves because they run that. So there's always something that we go through to to everybody just to make sure that we do all the right things. Uh, And we've been pen tested, all that sort of stuff many times over and never had issues. Um, But that said, one feature we added not that long ago, was um, we now have 2FA on all client shares. So clients get a... So the way it works in our software is you generate a share much like you would in Dropbox or Google Drive or something, a unique URL, which for most of our sales customers is enough because you can't guess it. The only way someone could get it is if someone shared it with them. But for this industry and the client data, personal data and all that sort of stuff, we added 2FA. So as long as you store a mobile number in XPAN to the clients, they'll be required to enter a mobile code to access that share that they just view in their browser. Um, and then they, they're in a browser on any device, in, in any browser, and they still get the full interactive experience as a client, but when they ask to them into that code. Cool. And as we sort of said, you're making it even easier too when you've got you've already got the mobile number in X-Plan, you're not having to rekey that, risk nope. the sort of double entry errors there. That's amazing. And then you mentioned too that even the integration partners themselves want you to go through security testing to make sure that the data that they're sharing with you is kept safe and secure too. Um, Which is, look, it's fair enough. It's, you know, oh, yeah. it, it, it's important data and we, we don't look at it like it's a, it's a pain that we have to go through. We actually look at it as as part of the product that it is. It takes security seriously, and it um, we take data everything to do with data seriously and compliance. I, as I mentioned earlier, that that investor of ours said we should be in this industry, and I just didn't understand how it made sense. But all the stuff we did that I mentioned at the beginning that was about brand consistency turns out is actually compliant. Just you know, with another yeah. name. So yeah. we actually had unknowingly built a really powerful compliance engine. So when we turned our attention to this industry, it kind of just made sense. Yeah, and I guess naturally that happens when you start from the top as well. You started with enterprises and then have made um, or made the way down into sort of um, SMBs, which is yeah, it's you've gone the the opposite of of a um, sort of traditional startup, which is obviously comes with its benefits. And then I guess sort of touching on integrations, we've we've talked a lot about that sort of out-of-the-box X-Plane integration and then you've yep. got the custom ones with the enterprise version of the tool. Uh, are businesses integrating their CRM? What are some other sort of examples of, of common integrations that you see when when maybe the you know enterprise version of the tool is being purchased? With enterprise, the CRM is always the first thing. Yep. So in all of our non-advice customers, I'd say probably three quarters um, are integrated with Salesforce and most of the rest with Dynamics because they're obviously the two big ones. But then we've got a bunch of really one-off CRMs we've integrated with. We've even got um, Kent removals for the, the brown trucks that get around town in Australia. <laughs> um, <laughs> so using it, it's very unusual um, use case, but they actually probably use it every day more than anyone, any of our other customers, but they've got a very um, removal industry-specific CRM and we've integrated with that. So okay. it's typically yep. the first thing. The second most common thing is um, BI tools. So lots of integrations with Power BI, um, Tableau, Tableau, and yeah. a bunch of those kind of things because that's where so much data lives. 
that we can pull out. But then it kind of goes into, we've integrated with ERP systems like SAP um, for our sins. We've um, integrated with lots of, um, actually people wouldn't probably think of this as a data source, but we integrate with a lot of repositories of logos and product images. Yeah. So that man, so I mentioned REA a couple of times. Give you an idea, they're presenting to to real estate agents. Real estate agents are very strong on their brand, yeah. so every product they REA show them has that agency's color on it, their brand on it. Um, for some of the products that are about their agents themselves, it has their photo because they have access to that. So. What it means is everything they're showing is super, super personalized without anybody having to do anything because there's a system that holds all of those images. Yeah. So it can be images, colors, um, anything. So, but we have customers that take orders in their presentations and we post data back. Actually, that's something that's really interesting and that we will do more of for advice. Um, we've talk, I've talked a lot about pulling data out of systems to make a document. We're doing more and more what I'd call workflow integration. So a good example is there's a slide in our advice product where on um, investment recommendations. And what it does now is you can click a button on the slide and it'll say it'll add an action. We have this uh, then have this interactive next step slide that an advisor will use in a meeting and collect the actions on the slide with the clients. So it's super clear what they've agreed to do. Even choose a date that you have agreed you're going to do something by. Um, at the moment, that's a really nice workload. We said we're going to do these things. We can do them on these dates. And that's saved with the documents forever. But what's really nice is when making those actions creates tasks back in your CRM automatically. So we do a lot of that with our enterprise customers and we'll, we'll definitely bring that through to uh, to make tasks in X plan for the advisors because um, it just, it's just really nice to be able to have a seamless kind of flow. Yeah, no, that's that's really compelling. And yeah, this, I'm just trying to think about the traditional approach is it's just, you know, writing action items in a table in Word and then it's not going anywhere and then how do you keep – everyone accountable. It's just a classic example of, you know, double or triple entry. Um, yep. It's really compelling. And that, that is it, was it Kent Removals um, example? I think if, if anyone wants to get an experience from the client side and they're moving house in the future, then obviously we know who to reach out to. But, Absolutely. Um, uh, the, the other one we're doing that's really big, actually, I should have thought of before is, um, and this will be releasing in about two weeks, is um, integration with DocuSign so that yep. um, everyone can do seamlessly digital authorities to proceed um, yep. from within the, the presentation. So you get to that so slide, you press there. the button. Yep, so it's yep. super, super seamless. We're doing DocuSign first because it's obviously the big one and then there'll be some others, other um, vendors in that space that will add afterwards. Um, yep. That one has been one of the highest re- requested features we've had as each of and that's very close. Definitely. And I think sort of once again, we're talking about that 99% functionality where, you know, oh, I don't have the DocuSign integration. My clients, they can consent or they can sign it in in um, Live Prezo, but the platform's not going to accept it because it's not with DocuSign or done in a certain way. So you're covering off on that too. That's really great. Um, you mentioned it before, Aaron, I think it was Prezo Bot. And I wanted to ask you about sort of what's coming up from a roadmap perspective and yeah, what's exciting you sort of longer term. You've mentioned the other things too around sort of workflow, et cetera, but what's got you excited about the roadmap and what's coming up? Well, there's a few, few kind of levels to it. I mentioned the AI, your question about AI at the beginning, we'll be adding the automated insights, which I think will be super helpful for everyone. Yeah. I mentioned DocuSign and uh, Prezo Bot for a for the situations where you want to allow your clients to request their own documents, are they more likely to be very cut down version? Yep. That they're really important. The other things are things like um, the two big requests we get at the moment. It's, it's amazing business. You get all these little requests, and then there's two really clear ones that everybody wants. And it's both for SOAs. So the first one is strategy tech, which. Yep. I, I totally get how important it is for an SOA, but it feels so uninteresting. It's a rabbit really hole, office. yeah. Well, yeah. It, it's, it's more just because 
it's going to be a big piece of work to put blocks of text on a slide. <laughs> mm. And I know they're really important blocks of text, but there's not a lot we can do to them to make them more interesting because they're really just blocks of text. Uh, and they're complicated just because every X plan site saves them somewhere different. So right. that's a challenge we're working with Myris on, uh, on how best to do that. And the other one, which is probably even bigger, but will be just awesome when we've done it, is um, Xtools Plus integration. So being able to show all sorts of modeling situations and scenarios there and then in the, in the middle of a presentation. Um, yep. So they're the two big ones that we'll be working on next. There's a whole host of smaller updates along the way, things like um, – uh, so the more investment focused practices, more of the kind of investments are reporting. So we have some now, but there'll be more coming in. So there's that mixture of kind of business as usual additions is the way I think of it, those big chunky ones. And then there's the kind of more platform based additions like DocuSign and um, the PrezoBot stuff. So yeah, there's a lot to go on. The other one is um, a lot of people would like to be able to share our Prezos via their client portal. Yeah. So eventually there'll be a button to say, don't instead of generate a link, just make Embed the link it. but yep. but send it via my prosperity or um, X Plans client portal or which, whichever one that you want. So which just adds that extra layer of security and um, yep. workflow to it. So yeah, they're the they're the big things, I guess, workflow and um, more automation. Love it. No, that's really exciting. And I guess, yeah, Aaron, I've really enjoyed the discussion today. What's the, the best way to sort of progress the conversation or, or learn more? So we have we have two uh, two week trials, free two week trials for any practice who wants to give it a go. So no commitment, you can cancel at any time, but it's a great way to uh, log in. And we didn't go through it in detail, but I mentioned it briefly at the beginning, you get our apps, uh, whichever app for your desktop, and sign in with your X-Plan account and then you can just make Prezo and within a few minutes you'll be able to see if all the data is coming through where you expect it. Um, and that's obviously going to depend on how the X-Plan site is set up. But yeah, it's a great way to, to give it a go and then you have your two weeks to trial it and then um, it's only month to month after that. Um, so there's, there's never any kind of long-term commitment unless – you're a dealer group who want to go the, the, the kind of enterprise approach, then it's a whole different story, but you can have anything you want, basically. Um, but for most people, even some of the groups who are thinking of going enterprise, you're starting with the off-the-shelf pro- product because it's easy. Um, so as long as the x site has been activated, uh, which we can't control, anyone from that site can just sign up and give it, get a trial and for those where the site isn't set up, the process typically takes 24 hours once we've spoken to the right person who looks after the site. Uh, yep. So it's, it's quick and painless. So, so we've tried to make it as seamless as possible for people to just give it a go because we know it's new and different and scary for a lot of people, so we wanted to make it the barriers as low as possible. Yeah. I was going to say, you've, you've just sort of adding to the approachability even more with the free trial and then the sort of no lock-in month-to-month contract. So, yep. yeah, well done. And congratulations on a fantastic product. And Aaron, thanks so much again for your time. Thank you. Appreciate it.